I appreciate Brother, um, Brother Crisco's prayer, Brother Tony's prayer, as he really from his heart was just pouring out this, this absolute truth that, that really as, as Christians sometimes we struggle when we look around us and we see, we see racial injustice and we see people that are treated differently because of the color of their skin. And, you know, I, I, would, I would love to say that, you know, as a pastor, you know, I had this master plan of all that I thought we needed to cover. And this was, you know, in this master plan of how I thought would fit into this week. But the reality is the Holy Spirit knew that this was something that we would need to address as a church. Uh, this is not something that I had, I had planned intentionally uh, as far as in my wisdom, but simply as I laid out our study through the book of Acts, this was the next thing that we're going to be looking at. We have about 10 to 11 lessons we're going to look at from the early church, and we've already looked at seven of them. And so we come to tonight, and we're faced with a circumstance in Acts chapter 10. And it's actually the same passage that we, that we watched a sermon on about three or four weeks ago on a Sunday evening. Now, obviously, uh, I, am, I am no Kenny Baldwin. Uh, Brother Kenny Baldwin's message on this passage was just fantastic. If you did not have a chance to watch that sermon, uh, ask, ask me, shoot me a text, I'd be more than happy to send you the link to that sermon to watch online. Probably one of the most powerful sermons that addresses the importance of us as a church, as a whole, being willing to do whatever it takes to reach people. And sometimes it means moving outside of the things that we're comfortable with and recognizing issues that we may have as a church. Very powerful message. So tonight we're going to look at that same passage, but obviously a little bit different. We're looking more at the church itself. And, and the question I want to ask tonight is, what do we do when we as a church recognize that we have prejudice in our own heart? And I, I, I want to even broaden it a little bit because typically when we think about the word prejudice, we almost always think specifically about racial prejudice, dealing with the color of our skin. But the reality is the word prejudice simply means to prejudge to prejudge, to have a judgment before you know all of the facts. And that often happens when we look at someone and we judge their character based on the externals that we know about them, and that may include the color of their skin, but it can include a lot of other things as well. A person that has more education than us versus a person that has less education than us. A person that makes more money than us versus a person that makes less money than us. A person who has, who, who has lived in the community less than us versus a person who has lived in the community longer than us. A, a person who has been a member of the church longer than we have versus a person who has member, been a member of the church less than we have. A person who is more involved versus a person who is less involved. It, it, it could then go to a person who has skin that is darker than mine versus a person who has skin that is lighter than mine. And any of those areas, we can have a, a prejudging spirit. And as a church, when we judge others based on what we think about them rather than about who they are, it limits our ability to spread the gospel. It really limits our, our opportunities to share Christ. We're going to look today in Acts chapter 10, and we're going to see a story that really echoes this issue of prejudice in the life of Peter. Prejudice was something that was very common in this culture. Uh, the Greek culture was very prejudiced against other cultures. Uh, you've probably heard of the word barbarian before, right? That word barbarian. In Greek culture, anyone who wasn't a Greek was considered a barbarian. It actually came, that word came from when, when we say the word confusion or to babble, someone who can't talk right, in the Greek, they would say to them, that sounds like barbar. To them, barbar just is like confusion. So a person who can't speak would obviously be a person who's not Greek. They're the barbarians. And so they, they had this very, this very close line on who they considered to be uh, worthy of their time, who they considered to be worthy of their social uh, acceptance versus those who were barbarians, people who could not speak Greek. And, and so the, the Greeks could not understand them. To them, it sounded like confusion, and they were barbarians. Uh, Aristotle himself uh, believed 
that those who lived in cold climates to the north had lots of courage and spirit, but very little intelligence. And people who lived in the warm south had plenty of intelligence, but they have little spirit and courage. Only the, only the Greeks who lived in the perfect middle climate had the perfect blend of character. And he, they, he literally believed that. That based on where you lived, based on the temperature, that controlled who you were as a person. So, so understand, the concept of prejudice is not new. It is not unique to the United States of America. It is not unique to our culture. And it is not unique to Christianity as well. It's not new to Christianity. Tonight, we're looking at a passage where Peter has to deal with the issue of prejudice in his life. And it comes when he is staying in Joppa. They're on the Mediterranean coast. It's about, um, and, and in the process, God sends someone to him who Peter has to learn a very important lesson that God intends for him to share the gospel with this man. So we don't often read passages this long. But tonight we're going to start in Acts chapter 10, verse, verse 1, and we're going to read to verse 34. So it's quite a lengthy passage, but for us to understand what's happening, we need to see what's taking place in the passage. The Bible says there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the, of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto him, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up into the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open. And a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts on the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice unto him, there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call, not thou that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again unto heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, Three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee unto his house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after, they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and, and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But, but Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man." And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or, or, or to come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as it was I, I was sent, as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. 
And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed at my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak to thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded to thee of God. Verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. And if we read on in the passage what we find in verse 44, while Peter yet sp spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Incredible passage, really an incredible story, because what we find is Peter, who initially is a little hesitant and a little un not understanding what's taking place, and yet we see God working in the background in order to bring Peter and Cornelius and these, these, all these men and people together so that the gospel can be spread. Cornelius was uh, a Gentile. He was one that was, would have been an individual that Peter and the other Jews would have not wanted to spend time with. Remember, the Romans were the inhabitants. They were ones that had overtaken and really were inhabiting the land. And to a Jewish person, spending time and, and, and dwelling with a Roman, a Roman citizen, a Roman centurion, would have been a very difficult, hard thing to do. And yet God had to teach Peter a very important lesson, and it's a lesson that we all need to learn as well. And that is the importance of guarding against the prejudices that we have in our heart toward those who don't look like us, who don't act like us, who don't talk like us, but rather that God is not a respecter of persons. And we see in this incredible lesson in this passage. I want us to look at five simple things tonight. Now, we've read the passage. We sort of know what it says. Five simple things. First of all, number one, this truth, we all tend to have personal pre prejudices. We all tend to have them. And I, and I say that based on the authority of this passage, that here Peter, who was one of the apostles, Peter, one of the closest 12, not even realizing that he had in his heart this, this prejudice against the gospel being spread to those who were not of his own kindred, how, much, how, how easy it would be for us as well. If even a godly man like Peter had a prejudice, then how easy it would be for us to be prejudiced toward people that don't look like us as well, and, and probably blind to them. The prejudice that Peter had in his heart was not something that he was aware of, but it's something that God had to make him aware of. God had to take him aside, and God had to show him a vision. And I'm thankful that this vision sort of is a good lesson for us as well. Now, let's look at the vision for just a second. The Bible says in verse number 11 that Peter saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him was a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. And the Bible tells us in verse 12 that on that great sheet that was coming down were all manner of animals, clean and unclean. And the voice comes from heaven and tells Peter, Peter, rise, kill and eat. Now, Peter, as a good Jew in his, in his vision, is recognizing that there is a distinction between what he is allowed to eat and what he is not allowed to eat according to the law. And so there's this conflict in Peter's mind because that which is clean is something that God has ordained that we should eat. That which is not clean is something that we should not be eating. Now, I, I believe if, if, if I were Jewish and, and if I were, if, and it's sort of a, a, a conflict here because if someone is a practicing Jew, then they don't believe the New Testament is for them. They would consider that our Bible. The New Testament is what they call a Christian's Bible. The Old Testament is their Bible. But for someone who is Jewish, this passage is very clear that Peter, as a Jew, is being released from the dietary restrictions. And I believe from this point onward that Jewish people, as they were transitioning out from underneath the law, as they're now transitioning into grace, and we see now the, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that becomes what our, their faith is in, that this dietary restrictions are no, longer, are no longer held to the Jewish people. But that's not what the 
vision means. You know, it's easy for us to look at the vision and think that's, well, that's its intention. That's not what it meant. In fact, Peter knew that's not what it meant. Because the, the whole purpose of this vision was for Peter to recognize that those which were clean, which would have been the Jews, and those who were unclean, which would have been those that were considered the Gentiles, that the gospel is effective and necessary for both groups. And Peter, you're going to have to be able to move beyond just sharing the gospel with the people that you think need to hear it. And you're going to have to be ready to share the gospel with people of every tribe and every nation because those are the people who I died for. And what we see happening in the book of Acts as we work our way through this is there's a turning point that's going to happen. The first part of the book of Acts is primarily the gospel in Jerusalem and in Judea. But then we're starting to see a shift into Samaria and then into the uttermost parts. And guess what? If Cornelius and Peter had never crossed paths that day, then the gospel would not have moved forward into the uttermost parts as God intended. This was part of God's plan. This was part of God's intention that, that Peter would be willing to look beyond this personal, this sort of this holdup that he had toward giving the gospel to those who were not Jewish. Now, I want to make sure that we make this point clear. This is not saying that we look beyond sin. This is not saying that we don't, as Christians, stand up for righteousness and take a stand against sin. But there are often externals that hold us back from sharing the gospel with people. Let's, let's say that again. Let's take a deep breath because it's a hard thing for us to face. Sometimes there are externals that would keep us from sharing the gospel with someone. I pray that God would remove the blinders of our own sin and allow us to see that everyone needs the gospel. Everyone needs the gospel. Someone, someone walks by you that is covered in tattoos from head to foot, and often our reaction is to see that, and we, we, we don't want anything to do with a person who looks like that. Listen, Jesus died for that person. They need the gospel. A person who has a different skin color than you have, than, or than I have, may be lighter, may be darker, or someone who comes from a different background. Maybe they, they came up in a, a background where they had more money, or they've come up in a background where they have much less money. Jesus died for them. And as Christians, we have to be willing to step back and recognize that even within our own hearts, and I'm being transparent with you tonight, the same thing happens in my heart. There are people that will walk by, and the Holy Spirit will have to grip my heart and say, stop, you need to talk with this person. You need to share Christ with this person. You need to be, you need to be a, a, a light to this individual. A couple of, um, I, I'm going to say this ashamedly because I, I didn't listen to the Holy Spirit the first time it happened, but I'll share this example. <laughs> This was last year. I think Andrew was in the truck with me, and we were driving. I think we were driving to go hunting over on James Dunlap's property. Andrew, is that right? Is that where we're headed? I think we're headed that direction. And uh, I was in the truck. Andrew was with me. So we had camouflage clothes on. It was probably a Friday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon, about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. So y'all, many of you know where Brother James lives. It doesn't go to our church, but is in our community, lives over on, on Dan Road. And so I was headed over that direction, and there's a cut-through road that goes from here over to Dan Road. And as I took that cut-through road, we passed a couple of houses, and there were, there were some people, there were a couple of black gentlemen sitting out, in the front, sitting out in the front yard by a table as I drove by. And uh, Brother Tony's nodding his head. You've probably seen those gentlemen. If you've, if you've driven over that direction. Every day. Every day. I was driving by, and as soon as I saw them, the Holy Spirit said, you need to stop and talk with them. Now, as many times as I've driven by, I don't think I had ever seen them out there, but they're there. They're, in that, they're part of our community. I had never introduced myself, and, and for as much as it is easy for us to introduce who we are and, you know, someone's new in the community, let's give them a housewarming gift, and it's so nice to meet you. We're so glad you're part of our community. I had never stopped there. I'd never seen those gentlemen, and the Holy Spirit seen me stop me and talk with them. And immediately, there was this conflict that came up in my heart because I had something to do, or I was busy, or, or I'll be honest with you, maybe it was just 
my desire to not stop. And so we drove by. And I think we made it down to the stop sign. And that entire time, I mean, the Holy Spirit has just beat me over the head. I can't believe, I can't, you know, I mean, the Holy Spirit's just given it to me. And I knew if we kept going and we made it to our hunting stand, I was going to be thinking about that all night. And I, I could not, I, I, I had to make it right. I had to obey. So I turned the truck around and Andrew, Andrew said, Dad, what are you doing? Because we had, you know, we're, we're close to where we're hunting. Pulled in, pulled in their driveway, got out. They were, a little, they were a little shocked. Here's this man getting out in full hunting gear out of his truck. Who, who they had seen just pull by, and now I pull back in, and I, and I went up to those three, men, those three men, and I talked to them briefly, introduced myself. And, you know, there have been other opportunities that I've gone by there that I've stopped again and just, just talked to them. And within my own heart that day, even in that little instance, a personal prejudice was revealed in my own heart. It's so easy for it to be there, and we don't even know it's there. And it doesn't matter whether it's over the color of our skin or whether it is over how much money we make or where we grew up. The reality is we have, we have to be aware that no matter who we are as believers, we can treat people differently, and when we do, it hinders the spread of the gospel. The second thing we see from this passage is is that God was gracious in working through Peter's prejudice. And I'm thankful that God is gracious with us as well. Uh, notice in the passage, uh, the Bible tells us that God sent an angel to Cornelius. We read that at the beginning, at the beginning of chapter 10. And, and not only does God send an angel to Cornelius, but then God sends a vision to Peter. And in fact, God sends the vision to Peter three times... All of this is God's way of gradually helping to break Peter out of his comfort zone. God was preparing his heart. God was allowing him to see beyond the, the differences between the Jews and the Gentiles so that he would recognize that the gospel needed to go out to all groups of people. I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord worked gradually with Peter and slowly worked him along so that at the point that they asked Peter to come with them, Peter was willing to go. Now, at that point, the Bible tells us that Peter didn't fully understand what God was doing. You know, when God uses us through our personal prejudices, sometimes we don't understand what God's doing with that. We don't understand what God's trying to accomplish. Peter didn't know what was being accomplished. When, when they invited Peter to come, he went and the Bible tells us, verse number, verse number 29, he says, I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. Okay, I'm here. What, what do you need of me? What can I do for you? Peter didn't understand what God was intending. And yet God graciously brought him along that process in order to, in order to allow him to minister. And it's a process that sometimes we fail on. Just because God has, is, is working us through that process as a church or even as, a, as an individual, it doesn't mean we aren't going to fail in that. The Bible tells us, as we read later in the book of Acts, that Peter again struggled with prejudice when it, when it came to Antioch. Antioch was truly, if you want to call it a multiracial church, it was a church full of people of every, every tongue, people of different ethnicities. They were all there at that church. And when Peter went to the church, the Bible tells us that he was just eating with everyone. But then there were some devout Jews from Jerusalem that came. And what did Peter do? He got up from the table with the Gentiles and he distanced himself from them and just sat with the Jews. And you know, it's interesting that in the book of Galatians, Paul calls Peter out for that. Paul recognizes that though Peter was an apostle, though Peter was a disciple, Peter, even later in his life, continued to struggle with treating people differently based on how he would be perceived. But it's a process, and I'm thankful that God brings us along in that process. Third, third thing I want us to see is what's the purpose? Why, why does God bring us along in this process? And the purpose is because he wants to use us to share the gospel with all people. God wants to use us to share the gospel with all people. When we set up barriers between us and other people, no matter what the barrier would be, 
socioeconomic, race, upbringing, amount of education, no matter what that barrier may be, when we put up barriers of our own, it keeps us from being able to share Christ with him. There was only one thing that God wanted to accomplish through Peter in Acts chapter 10, and you know what it was? To bring Cornelius to the saving truth of the gospel. That was, that was the whole purpose. That the entire purpose of this chapter, the vision, all of this, was so that Peter would recognize that God is not a respecter of persons. And God intends that we as a church, now I'm talking to us, God intends that we as a church would not put up personal barriers that would keep us from being able to share the gospel with all people. I, I, hope, as a, I hope for you as individuals and then for us as a church, when we see, one come, see someone come across our path that doesn't look like us, that doesn't act like us, that doesn't have our background, they don't have a church upbringing, that our first response isn't to push them outside. Our first response should be, okay, Lord, you've brought them across my path. Help me to show the love of Christ to them. When, when we are willing to use, when we are willing to see that God wants to use us as a gospel witness, then we realize that people that come across our path, God has done that with intention. God's purpose is to be glorified among the nations. It's interesting that Cornelius was seeking after something. The Holy Spirit, seeing Cornelius' desire, sent him an angel that said, go find Peter. If Peter had responded negatively, you had Cornelius, who was a man desiring to know truth, that would not have known truth. You know, it's, we didn't read through the passage, but it's interesting as Peter is speaking. Uh, look with me if you would. Uh, Peter starts talking in verse number 37. He kind of goes through the story. He talks about uh, this God anointed Jesus of Nazareth uh, who went about doing good and healing. Uh, at verse 39, and we are all witnesses um, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Verse 40, God raised him up on the third day. Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach of these, of, to, unto the people. Verse 43, uh, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And then the next thing, the next thing in verse number 44 says, while Peter yet spake these words. Now it's interesting what fra that phraseology, what that means is Peter wasn't done. Peter wasn't finished. Now, Peter had given a pretty good synopsis of the gospel. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. The Jews, the unbelieving Jews, had him crucified. Then God rose him. He died, was buried, and he rose again the third day. And God has now sent us to preach of that gospel. And that is why I'm here. That's what God has called me to do is preach the gospel. And I don't know what else Peter was planning on saying, but Peter wasn't done speaking yet. It wasn't the invitation time. Peter didn't tell everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. Peter was still in the process of talking. And the Bible says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. There was a move of the Holy Spirit. Cornelius and those men, the people that were around him, were looking. They were searching for truth. I wonder how many times God brings someone across our path that is searching for truth. But because of something that makes us uncomfortable, we're not willing to be the ones to share with them that truth. Because there's something that makes us uncomfortable. And that something can be a lot of different things that when you all boil down to it, they are all things that we've prejudged a person based on an appearance or what we think about them, instead of looking at a person who needs Jesus Christ. That's what we should judge a person by. It's a person that needs Jesus. God's intention was to use Peter to share the gospel. I, I love this in Revelation chapter 5. Let's turn there. I want you to read this verse. This is such, an, such a beautiful, such beautiful language. Revelation chapter 5. verse 9. Read verse 8 and 9. Revelation 5, verse 8 and 9. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. 
And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the people. Notice what it says. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Would you say those, those phrases with me? Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Oh, that's beautiful. See, the gospel is not just for people that look like us. In fact, I think often we think that America is like the central area, the central location of the gospel, and somehow we are the ones that are sending the gospel out to the rest of the world. Let me tell you, that is, a very, that is a very American-centric view of the gospel. The gospel is not America's gospel. The gospel is just as powerful in every country around the world. And I would dare say right now in this world, there are some countries that are more centered on the gospel than the United States of America. There are some countries that are more open to the gospel where there's revival happening greater than it has happened in the United States of America. And yet we somehow think that we own the gospel and we're sending it out to the rest of the world. And if we don't tell them, no one's going to hear. The reality is the gospel is as much theirs as it is ours. And I'm so thankful that God is going to call and is calling people of every tribe, of every tongue, and of every nation. What an incredible passage as we see that reflection of heaven. The gospel is not just for us, it's for people of every group. The fourth thing I want us to see as we come toward the end tonight is that when we are confronted with our prejudice, when we are confronted with our tendency to prejudge people or to not give them the gospel because of some characteristic in them, there's only one choice we have, and that is to obey. And Peter's, Peter's challenge was to obey. Peter was called to obey. At first, Peter was a little confused, chapter 10, verse number 14. But Peter said, remember, this is, this is him and his vision, but Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And I realize we could look at this and we could really give Peter a hard time, but the reality is, according to the law, there were certain things that Peter was not allowed to eat. And what, this, what he was being told by the angel in this vision was that he was free to eat of these things. And in his vision, he's, he's tied to the law. He's tied to the, his, his, his background, his upbringing, the things that he has been taught. And initially, there was a little bit of confusion because God is trying to teach him a lesson about who needs to hear the gospel. And Peter was not sure about what was taking place. But after the vision was repeated three times, the Bible tells us that Peter begins to understand what's going on uh, in, in, in chapter 10, verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. That's, that's, those are important words. I would say for every pastor, those are important words. Now, Brother Stephen, as God has called you into ministry, I would challenge you, memorize that verse. Because as a pastor, when you are in leadership position, as a Sunday school teacher, as a, as a deacon, anytime we are ministering in front of other people, it's possible or there's a tendency for people to look up to you in that leadership position and to treat you as different and to treat you as something special. Let me tell you right now, I'm just a man. And I'm telling you that for me. I'm just a man. I'm, I'm thankful that God has given me the privilege of pastoring here at Needham's Grove Baptist Church. But as your pastor, I'm not a dictator. I don't command what we do as a church. I, I'm, I'm a leader here, and my job is to cast the vision, and we, we follow along as we study God's Word together. But the reality is, pastors are not to be worshipped. Peter was not to be worshipped. And I'm thankful that Peter recognized that. Peter looks at Cornelius, he says, whoa, 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 get, get up. Stop, stop bowing to me. I'm not one to be worshipped. I'm a man just like you're a man. We're to be treated the same. Peter begins to realize that in order to share the gospel with Cornelius, in order, to, in order to be everything to him he should be, he was going to have to treat him equally. You know, I've read it this way. We should view ourselves as beggars whose job it is to show others beggars where we find God's free bread. Our, 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 our position should be, we should view ourselves as beggars 
whose job is to show other beggars where to find God's free bread. You, you think we, we are owed anything by God? Do you think God somehow looks on us and, and he looks at us as a favorable, con favorable congregation or favorable believers? No, no, no. We just every day go to the green pastures of God's word and say, God, feed us. And when we find those green pastures, we should say to the people that are next to us, hey, come along with me. Let's go to God's green pastures together. We're just beggars trying to learn from God, trying to understand his word, trying to grow from what he gives to us. And I'm thankful that Peter was willing to obey. The final thing I want us to look at is this, that God used Peter because he was willing to look beyond that personal prejudice. God used him. That God prepared Cornelius. God prepared Peter. God brought them together. And then the Bible tells us that Peter, verse, Peter began to command, verse 33, to hear all the things which are commanded thee of God. He began to preach. Peter didn't even have a chance to finish his message. And God was already moving. You know, I, I, I hurt, honestly, I hurt today looking at all the things that are going on in our country. Um, you know, this last week, and I appreciate Brother, Brother Tony mentioning this in his prayer as well, this last week, seeing the video of, of that man who was, who was killed. And, you know, no matter what extenuating circumstances there may be, it, it's painful, it's, it should hurt us to see someone grasping for breath and not being able to breathe. In our humanity, we recognize that's, that's, that's hard, that's, 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 that's difficult. And when we look at a situation like that, our heart should break for families, our heart should break for those that are affected. But then we move beyond and we recognize that we live in a country where people have the right to protest and people have the right to, to disagree with things that are going on. And we, we actually saw that initially in, in some different places where it was peaceful. In fact, some cities last night, there were some peaceful protests. But it breaks my heart to see even protests being used as an excuse to do things that in and of themselves are illegal and dangerous and hurtful and harmful to others. My heart breaks for the, for the, 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 the small business owners who wanted to come in to work today and their businesses were burnt down. For people that had businesses and, and, and you know, had a job that they were wanting to come to today and their jobs are burned down. And, and my heart breaks even today as I hear about other even smaller, smaller towns and smaller communities where they have protests planned that could spill over into violence. As much as we can be angered at that, God still expects us as believers to lay aside the, the, the barriers that we put up to the gospel. And God has called us to minister to the people in our community. And that doesn't matter whether they look like us or not. It doesn't matter whether they have the same upbringing as us or not. Or whether they make the same amount of money as us or not. Peter had to learn that lesson in a very hard way. And I pray that God would allow us as individuals and as a church to be salt and light in our community no matter, no matter what barriers we may have put up in the past that we would tear those down and say, okay, Lord, help us to minister to people. Help us to minister to people. And I'm thankful that God gives us this story of Peter because Peter learned the lesson. Now, he still struggled later again with it, a little bit different situation, but in this, in this case, Peter learned his lesson, and I'm thankful that Peter embraced it. And because of that, the gospel went out to the Gentiles. I, I would love for us as a church to say, okay, Lord, what can we do in our community? And let's take down anything that personally may keep us from doing that. Lord, help us to be used. Help us to be a light to the people that we come in contact with. Thank <laughs> you.